keynote speakers. Hello, my name is here. Uh, hi, audience. Thank you so much for joining us on this day. My name is Eduardo. I am a marketing manager, and I'm so excited to take the road to VP of DevOps with you today with those brightest minds in the audience. Please feel free to go into the chat and let us know where you come from. Obviously, the global footprint of our city. I am in New York City. Um, oh. Is it better now, my audio? Thank you, thank you for letting me know. Uh, thank you, Samantha. Is it better? Awesome. Uh, so audience, I was saying, uh, go to the chat and let us know where you're calling from because we like to know the global footprint of our elite community. I am in New York City. I know that Brooke is in London. Uh, Mallory is in Indiana. Mike, where are you based? I'm right outside New York City as well. Awesome. Uh, so we have many different um, time zones in here. We have people from San Francisco, uh, Awesome, Chicago, all, all over the country. So let's kick things off. Uh, we are here today to talk about uh, the road to VP of RevOps. That should be an amazing discussion. Uh, for those new here, welcome to Modern Sales Pros. We are the world's largest and finest community for more than 35,000 members in sales management, leadership, operations, and enablement. We are all about taking the road less traveled and bringing you along for the journey. Our mission is to help uh, you tackle tough questions and discover opportunities you might not even know exist. We do this through vibrant live sessions like this one you were engaging online with us. Uh, we have an online forum where you can go and ask any questions that you want and our community will answer it for you. Uh, we have our quarterly summits. Uh, I have a slide coming up uh, about our upcoming summit and I'll drop a link in the chat for you. And we also having in-person events nationwide, which is Great. As I mentioned here, we have our quarterly summit coming up on March 5th and 6th. Um, I will drop a link in the chat in a few minutes for you to register, but I would say don't miss it. It's going to be amazing. We have more than 15 events uh, in two days and more than 60 speakers. Uh, let's focus on this event before uh, we jump into the conversation. Um, quick has the heads up. This event is being recorded and you will receive a link for the recording right after uh, we are done here. Um, so you can have all this knowledge that uh, our speakers will drop in, into you today uh, at any moment. It will be handy for you. Uh, I was talking with these speakers. They are saying they want to feel energized and important uh, going through this week. So let's use the chat uh, to ask a lot of questions. We also have the Q&A panel on your right-hand side. So audience, ask all your questions to give this uh, bump of energy for our speakers today. Um, the best thing about Modern Sales Pros I didn't mention before is that we have amazing partners. And today we have EverStage partnering with us to put this event together. Um, we have Mike here from EverStage. So Mike, I will pass the mic uh, to you, uh, and then you can introduce yourself, introduce us to every stage, and then you can kick off the conversation with our speakers. I'll be listening live, taking a lot of notes, and I'll be back for some outro. Is that right? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, and thank you to everybody for uh, for for joining today and attending for today. We're really excited about talking about an awesome topic. Um, you know, I think uh, the market of being in RevOps. Um, is one that there's a lot of roads to get to and, and helping individuals really kind of like, you know, uh, put some, uh, you know, put some tracks uh, on that road and really kind of have some guidance about how you grow your career in RevOps I, is always, I think, one of the most exciting topics that, um, you know, that, uh, that we can bring. So, uh, so excited to have our audience here. So excited to have Brooke and Mallory um, to kind of explain their stories and, and hopefully get a lot of value for everybody that's joined. Um, but to start by way of introduction, so my name is Mike Groeneveld. I'm the VP of Global Sales here at EverStage. Um, I've been in software sales for 15 plus years, sales leadership for you know 10 plus of that, um, and and working really extensively with RevOps, sales ops, um, you know, throughout my entire career. I always make the joke that um, you know uh, my RevOps people are always probably my favorite people to work with internally. I like to call them my psychiatrists. I'll come to them with problems that I have and scenarios I'm dealing with. I, you know, uh, I'll put my feet up on the couch and vent sometimes, and we can, you know, really kind of collaborate together to get the best out of our people. Um, and it's always amazing to serve this community. Uh, I'm totally honored. I think most folks in uh, the RevOps community are those types of people that wear a lot of hats and and you know maybe don't get the visibility that they certainly deserve. Um, and so thank you for everybody. I'm sure, uh, you know, sometimes a, a thank you gets skipped, some, you know, in, in your organizations. And let me be the first to give it to you. 
Um, and, uh, you know, obviously this event is sponsored by my company, EverStage. Uh, we're a commission automations platform, uh, you know, and, and ultimately we help organizations automate the whole commission calculation process and then give reps visibility into how to get the most out of their compensation plans. So, uh, you know, we're the number one rated, uh, you know, in the mid market and enterprise uh, solution on Gartner and G2. Uh, we have over a thousand plus customer reviews and we have a 4.9 and 5.0 rating on both respectively. Um, and so if that's a, a problem that you guys have, uh, feel free to check us out. You know, I, I think you'll be uh, uh, very happy with what uh, what you see. Um, but enough about EverStage. Uh, definitely want to you know hand it over to Brooke and Mallory uh, for you guys to introduce yourselves. So, uh, Brooke, why don't you why don't you start us off? Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, I'm Brooke Trusseter. I am originally from San Francisco, but I am living, been living in London for the last four years. So sadly, I still have my American accent. So if you're confused about the location, that's why. Uh, I've been in RevOps about 10 years. Uh, prior to that, I was in sales for about 10 years. Uh, the last four years, I've been in payment. So in the fintech space in London, which is Kind of the epicenter for fintech so it's been an interesting uh, journey of learning lots of new things and then majority of my career prior to that was in enterprise SaaS. so those are kind of my two areas of expertise is enterprise SaaS and uh, payments and i will hand it off to mallory thank you nice to meet you guys my name is mallory i live in indiana um not quite as exciting as london and new york but you know we get by here <laughs> Um, excited to talk with you guys today. I lead operations at Nihilus. For us, that's RevOps and business operations, um, but excited to talk more about how I ended up here and how I really came up through the marketing side of things. So we'll talk about that later. Love it. Love it. Thank you both. Um, and yeah, I think we can probably just jump right into it. Um, just at a high level, we got a couple topics that uh, you know we will be bouncing around uh, with. Uh, one of them is just what does a day in the life of a VP of RevOps look like? Um, what are focus areas and current challenges uh, of, of a VP of RevOps? Um, how to collaborate effectively with fellow VPs and the C-suite? Um, you know, what a VP of RevOps should look for when building out a team? And certainly what the future of RevOps really, uh, you know, really, uh, uh, you know, looks like for uh, all of our attendees. So um, that's kind of the rough outline for what we had planned. And uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and we'll get into uh, what Brooke and Mallory think about these things. So, um, you know, my first question, and, and Brooke, we'll kind of start with you. Uh, so RevOps, I think it's a, a really loaded term. Uh, I think a lot of folks have different uh, definitions uh, for what RevOps is. Um, and so, you know, I'd love for you to describe kind of what is the role of RevOps, why does the role exist, and what you know, some of the key functions are. Yeah, so um, I have been around long enough to remember when it was all called sales ops in your yeah. SOPS functions that we used to be called that. Uh, and that generally was mostly around Salesforce and reporting, right? That was kind of the sales ops sort of functions. Uh, and sometimes you'd have comp in there, you know, that sort of thing. Um, revenue operations now much more of the, the way that the function is described tends to include really the end to end journey of how you are um, getting revenue from your merchants or customers. It's interesting for me because I moved to London four years ago. RevOps is not really a function that is well known in the UK. If you were to search for people with RevOps in their title, it's quite small. Like in the Bay Area, there's probably thousands of people with RevOps titles. So coming to London has been a bit of an education journey for me, which is what does RevOps actually do and is owned? My prior company, they didn't hire a RevOps function until 500 employees. And they hired it because the investors, the US investors had said, you need a RevOps function. <laughs> they said, what's that? And then <laughs> I ended up being the first RevOps hire. So that is a, it is interesting geographically because in the US, I think now your CRO or your sales leader would say like, this is my chief of staff. I wouldn't even dream of trying to build out an org without a RevOps leader. I'm in a space where it's much newer concept in, you know, in the UK and I think probably even broadly more in Europe. Um, so, it, I mean, for me, it's the end to end journey. It's a little bit different in payments and I'll have Mallory speak to the business operations side of it, but for me in payments, it's a bit different because we have to onboard our merchants through a compliance journey and do KYC and make sure that they're legal and legit and they're not laundering money and they're not on sanctions list. 
So RevOps in payments is this whole journey also about how do we get our merchants approved so that we can work with them, which I sometimes miss the days of SaaS software where if they'll sign the DocuSign, they're your customer. That's, uh, that's the last step for us, right? We have to do this whole journey. So in payments, there's a lot of other sort of in between getting your merchant onboarded. Um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll let Mallory talk to kind of the broader business operations and how the function is for in her world. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, to define revenue operations and just operations in general, like I mentioned, I, I actually started in marketing operations. And when people would say, what's marketing operations 10 years ago, I would just joke and I'd say, oh, I just keep the train on the tracks. Like, just trying to make sure everyone is like, okay. And um, really, I think that that comes down to alignment and, you know, making sure that all of your business stakeholders from sales to marketing to product and customer success really are aligned with each other so that we can get that revenue from point A to point Z. Um, so like Brooke is saying, it needs to encompass the entire customer journey. I definitely have a uh, I've talked to a lot of people who think that RevOps is just sales ops that got rebranded. And I feel bad for those folks because I think it needs to be something very different than that. So um, I've been lucky enough to be part of organizations where it is kind of like a centralized function that encompasses that entire journey for the customer. And as long as everyone can get on the same page, I think that's what's best for the customer. How much refereeing do you have to do to get to people, uh, to all these different departments to get on the same page? Not as much as maybe you think. Um, there there are some times, and I think that a lot of operators spend a surprising amount of time having one-on-one -on -one conversations before the big group conversation, because I feel like my job is to get people on the same page before we all get into the same room. That way we can have an effective meeting. Um, so, you know, there's a little bit of that, like, back channeling or talking to people ahead of time just to make sure there are no surprises, but CEOs don't like surprises. And so I think my job is to, to help with that and get everybody, you know, somewhat on the same page. I, uh, I, I hear you. I think you handled that very gracefully, uh, you know, prepping everybody to be aligned and understand how their role plays to the greater good, I think is a lot easier said than done. And uh, but also, I think develops value for for you and all of our audience in RevOps internally is that what a great skill to have. What an important part of the team to have everybody driving in, in the same direction um, and, and be that that person that really kind of gets them there. So, uh, you know, uh, I think it's, it's just awesome. Um, but, Brooke, you know, uh, uh, your journey is kind of the next thing I want to talk about. So. Uh, and I love this question because everybody's answer is always so different. Um, how has your journey to VP of RevOps been? Um, well, I would say there was no, I did not start out with the intent to end up where I've ended up. So I think those of us that have been working for 15 plus years, you realize you end up having two or three different careers. And where I've ended up is by no means what, you know, where I thought I was, you know, I had started with. So I had started in sales because both my parents were in sales. I was in the Silicon Valley and that's what everyone did in the Silicon Valley was selling software. So it's like, well, that's what I'm going to do. So I started at Microsoft and some other software companies. And then there was a big 09 crash. Everyone got laid off and I decided I know I can do this better and more operationally efficient than what I'm currently doing as a sales rep. And so that was the catalyst for me to switch over to like, I can do this better. Like I know I can op optimize things better. I know I can be more efficient with my time. And it was through all these frustrations of like day in and day out of all the time I wasted manually filling out stuff, not having data, who are my customers, who owns what, like all this insane stuff that to me, it's like, how do you, how is not every company running this way, which they're not. And so that was the catalyst for me to like, I can do this better. And so I got Salesforce certified. I started working as a Salesforce admin as it's, you know, like volunteer work, consulting, hired as a Salesforce admin, then was at a software company where I was promoted to director of sales systems. So kind of all the sales stack. And then eventually, you know, it was, okay, we needed someone to manage deal desk. Okay, go manage deal desk in the European, you know, region. 
okay, we need data and reporting. Okay, you pick that up. And then there's some things that you kind of just learn through osmosis. And then at some point I said, okay, I want to go to a small startup and go head be ahead of RevOps. And that's when you realize where your gaps are, right? So things like, okay, comp plans. I need to now write comp plans because I've not done that before. And having a good network of people, you know, former former heads of RevOps that were our mentors of mine have helped along the way. And MSP is a great resource of holy crap, I got to write an onboarding plan for a sales rep. And, you know, I, you know, for me, I'm not a sales enablement expert. I've always had the opportunity to hire great sales enablement people. I'm very system and data. So if you were to say like, what my strengths are systems and data, I'll hire, you know, where, where I don't have strengths like sales enablement. Uh, and then, then you change industries and then you have to start all over again. And you think, I know what I'm doing. And then you walk into a payments company and they say like, the way we bill, the way we price, the way we invoice, the way we forecast, it's all different from software. And then you start all over again and think, I thought I knew what I was doing, I've been doing this a really long time, and then it changes. So, uh, I, you know, kind of, I would say is, for me, the way I, this journey has been very indirect, right? I wouldn't have said to you five years ago, I'm gonna need payments in London. No, I couldn't have predicted that. And I moved February, 2020, six weeks before the whole country went into lockdown. So. I mean, no one would have picked the time that I did to move to London. Um, but what has been a path of is just always really hungry to learn new things, whether it's MSP or YouTube or blogs, articles, whatever. And then having a really great network of people that you can ping when, for instance, like we need to build out more demand gen and I ping my old VP of demand gen. Like, how did we do campaign attribution or something like that? Having a great network has been for me, a, a great path to filling in where, you know, you're not gonna be an expert on everything, but that's what your group of, you know, your crowd or your your crew that supports you. So that's kind of how I've ended up where I am. Very indirect. I love it. I love it. And, and, and I think uh, you articulate this really well, but being, I think the foundation of how you get to where you're at in your career and how you continue to grow and evolve is seeing a problem regardless of what space that problem is in and attacking that problem. And, you know, I, I don't, I, I assume this is how you feel, but certainly want to get your feedback on it is that when you see a problem, I think there's two ways that people normally take it. It's like, you can get annoyed by the problem or you can see the problem as the opportunity for yourself to have impact on your organization. And so, and it seems like in order to get to VP of RevOps in your career, it's not only wanting to attack the problem, it's also understanding that you can have some self, uh, uh, you know, uh, benefit to solving that problem for your organization. But I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on that, Brooke. Uh, as far as how I go about solving problems or? No, just the, just the approach. Like you see a problem. Oh, and yeah, yeah, attack yeah. That problem. Um, so my COO two weeks ago on an all hands call said this, the state of the default nature of everything is total chaos. <laughs> I pinged him on Slack and I was like, no, nature is all very orderly. I like order. It's humans that are causing the chaos, <laughs> AKA your sales reps or your, you know, I was like, nature's very orderly. It's the humans that are the chaos. And he had this Elmo meme with everything's on fire in the background. This is his background in the, in the all hands. Oh, this is our COO. And so for me, I'm very, like everything is orderly, right? Like my mind functions that way with checklists and spreadsheets and all the other nerdy stuff that most of us RevOps people, you know, embrace. Um, most problems for me are it's great. There's a house on fire. As I say to my team, every room in the house is on fire and you just have to figure out which fire we're going to put out today. And, uh, and that for me is in a startup journey. It's like, everything's on fire. There's a million problems. I love all of, solve all of them. The hardest part about this role is figuring out the right ones to do now, right? Like that's the hardest part. The actual real answer, and I had a mentor two companies ago, our head of product, who's been in the Valley a really long time and he helped scale out three or four startups. We were in a room and we were whiteboarding some problem about something we were trying to, how do we report, you know, multi-year deals and how do we book them or something like that. And he had said, you know, the reality is whatever decision we make today, it's going to be wrong in six months. Our entire business model will continue to iterate and it will be wrong in six months. Like inaction is worse than making a, like, 
you will never have all the information. You have to figure out what information you need to make a decision to solve the problem. And you just have to be willing to commit and move forward. And you have to recognize that you're going to pivot. You could be pivoting in six weeks, you know, or six months, who knows? In, in startup land, your go to market could change dramatically. Your, your competitors, your landscape can change so quickly that you just have to figure out which problem I'm going to solve and then do it as quickly as possible and not try to boil the ocean with requirements and blah, 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 you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's kind of my philosophy on decision making. Now, if it's like architecturally something we're building in Salesforce, yeah, we're not cutting corners on let's just make a decision, right? Like we have to kind of think through, like ob obviously I'm trying to avoid technical debt, but things like a lot of stuff is not as is important to get it right as it feels at the time. Like you'll look back in six months and go, why did we de debate the opportunity naming convention or like optite names or things that people get really wrapped around the axle on, which should our industry pick list values be things that just are immaterial really to most of the business. So that's my like figure out which problems have to be solved now and then path to resolution as fast as possible. You cannot, you cannot waste time on trying to solve problems for a month. It just, you, it, it's painful. So uh, that that's my philosophy on the the problem solving. And I say it all the time to my team with the, whatever we decide today, it'll be wrong in six months. It gives you a little bit of comfort. Like we're always going to be wrong. So just pick a path, right? Like just pick a path. So that's my philosophy. And be, com be comfortable in the chaos, right? Be comfortable with being fluid in your decision-making. Not everything has to be perfect because even when you try to make it perfect, a lot of times it's not. Right. Um, but you learn, you evolve, you get better. And I think you got to really create that culture of doing that uh, to get the most out of whatever decision you're trying to make. Right. Um, and so uh, but Mallory, I I'd love obviously love to understand kind of your road to RevOps and how that's been. Yeah, I uh, started on the marketing side, like I mentioned. So my first job out of school was during the 09 chaos and um, I was living in Indianapolis and really the only company that was growing and hiring was exact target. So all of my eggs were in that basket and I got very lucky started there right after graduation as a marketing analyst. And so lots of reporting, that's where I learned Salesforce and some marketing basics. And I'll never forget that we were coming up on our first like quarterly meeting with sales where I got tapped to go present to sales for the marketing ops thing. And we basically sat down with them and it was the sales directors and it was, you know, here's what marketing did for you this quarter. And I look back on that and I laugh because it was like once a quarter we got together and talked about marketing and sales alignment. And I would never dream of that setup now. It was just so long ago. Everything was very separate and we didn't collaborate in the same way. Uh, but today it's so different. It's so collaborative. And so I had that marketing operations background. I did demand gen, marketing automation, uh, managing marketing budgets and doing all of the ROI analysis that you could imagine. And through that process, I just got really good at marketing and sales alignment. So I knew enough about salespeople to know that I liked them. And let's be real, you have to like salespeople if you want to be in RevOps. <laughs> um, <laughs> you have to at least get along with them. Uh, and then I knew that I could figure the rest out. So um, after some time consulting on demand gen and marketing operations, being VP of marketing, I was taking some time off with my kids. And then one of my consulting opportunities turned into pipeline analysis. And they said, hey, can you help us understand like what's happening in the pipeline? What's our forecast? And I had never done that before, but I felt confident that I could help them figure that out. And that turned into slowly this full-time role at Terminus in revenue operations. And after a few months, they asked me to take on the team. Um, I didn't know a lot of things, kind of like what Brooke is saying. You know, all of a sudden you need to work out a comp plan and you think you know what motivates people, but you really do have to get in there and kind of do that discovery around what's unique to your business at the same time. Um, so did a lot of sales things for the first time at Terminus and learned that. But that was about five years ago, and I've been leading revenue operations since then. I love it. And and I, I think this is, uh, again, it's always one of my favorite questions because we have Salesforce admin, marketing ops, 
both becoming VP of, of RevOps. And uh, there's so many different paths to get there. Um, mm -hmm. And I just can't stress that enough. I think a lot of folks, uh, when they're early on in their career, they know they have the hustle, the grit, the problem solving desire, um, the ambition uh, to do something great. And I think this is when you have all of those skills, it doesn't matter where you start. You can certainly find a home in, in this area uh, and in this, uh, you know, uh, industry. Um, and I think you both of you guys are real testaments to that. So, um, you know, Mallory, obviously that's kind of how you got there, but walk me through kind of like, you know, um, you know, what does your day look like? What's one thing that you wish you knew at the beginning of your career that you know now? Yeah, I think day in the life, um, obviously a lot of meetings, you know, we try to keep it to something reasonable, but can't help in uh, having a lot of meetings. It does happen. So I think that for a RevOps leader, if you've got the kind of RevOps team that is focused on the entire business, you do have to get good at that context switching. And so in the morning, you're going to attend the sales forecast. In the afternoon, you're going to attend the marketing, advertising. Um, we have something we call digital ads party. So like later in the day, it's all about marketing. And then in the middle of the day, you're working on your scorecard that brings it all together. And so I think that it's just important to try to give attention to each department as if they were your main focus. They want to feel as though you're really dedicated to them. Um, but then also bring in the context from everybody else to the person that you're talking with. So lots of calls and lots of scorecards and reporting um, and then just answering questions. So, you know, I do enjoy just having standups with my team and brainstorming with my team on how we want to solution something. I used to be a, a Salesforce admin years ago and, you know, it kind of expired and I'm not a Salesforce admin anymore, but I still know enough to be dangerous and participate in the conversation and come up with ideas, uh, which I think is really fun. Awesome. Awesome. That's great. And <laughs> Salesforce admin sounds like a pretty uh, relevant skill to have. Um, but Brooke, yes. I'd obviously love your take on it. Yeah. So I was trying to think like, what's the one thing I wish I had known at the beginning of my career? I think, so I read a book a couple of years ago when I was, in a role where I was going to be hiring more people. It was like, what do you hire for? And like, how do you find the right people to hire? And it's a book um, uh, written by Patrick Lencioni. And he talks about, I'm trying to think of the name of it. It's not the advantage. It's a different one. And he says, okay, oh, the ideal team player is the book. And um, in there, and I had all my directs read it uh, when I was at my last company and we, we were building out the team quite broadly is, the, the ideal people to hire are hungry, humble, and a high EQ. And that if you have people who are hungry and humble, you could teach a lot of the other skills, but you cannot teach hungry, humble, and high EQ. It's taken a long time to figure those things out, which is like, what's, how do I know the person I'm investing in the hiring for is the right person? And they're not going to cause chaos in your team or that sort of thing. Um, and I think, maybe naturally because like my background is I'm an athlete and I played volleyball for a really long time. And so a lot of my thinking is around like just continual small iterations because in volleyball or any other sport, you do a hundred serves every day, every day, every day, every day. And so it's like muscle memory, that sort of thing. And so in RevOps for me, I've kind of taken the same sort of path, which is, okay, how do I small incrementally get better every day? How do I hire, you know, the next time around, how do I not make a hiring mistake or how do I, make sure I'm, you know, getting someone that's going to fit with the rest of the team. Um, and I'm really a fan of finding people who are experts in other areas and learning from them or borrowing or however you, know, you want to attribute. Um, so I, I think for me, it's just always be a student of learning. Um, and, you know, I will have implemented a tool four years ago and how much can change in the market. So you can't just assume, you know, everything or these tools or these vendors are the best practice. Uh, I lean on Salesforce a lot for, especially in the payments world, because it's just so uniquely different, uh, is to just continually be learning and figuring out how you can make sure that you're getting better and whether it's 
business books. I mean, I'm not a huge, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of like podcasts or all these business books, but every once in a while, there'll be a book out there where they've spent 10 years researching. And I, I'm really, I really like Patrick Lencioni or Brene Brown, you know, some of these, they spent years of research and then it's like, you can shortcut your learning, like shortcut your learning. They did the 10 years worth of work. And now I can benefit from the knowledge or insights of that. So I think it would be just always have like, you're always learning, always be a student of things would be kind of the, uh, and my advice to my younger self, which would have been to build a network earlier, to feel comfortable being able to lean on people and admit things that you don't know and be okay with like asking for help more. Uh, when you're younger in your career, or earlier in your career, you feel like you have to always present that you know everything or how to answer the question. And as you get more into your career, you feel more comfortable saying like, I actually don't know that at all, but let me go figure it out. I know some good people I can ask and I can get feedback from. Um, that takes a lot of like a lot of learning before you feel comfortable enough or confident to be like, I know this really well, but sales enablement, I don't know. Let's go ask someone that sort of those sort of topics. So I think one of the things I wish I'd done earlier in my career is have more of a mentorship and a relationship with more senior RevOps people. Um, and and more of been more proactive about like finding paths for learning outside of my organization. I, I, I really feel strongly like you need a mentor outside of the organization. You're in. <clears throat> you need sponsors within your organization that sponsor you and want to see you be successful. But for you to actually grow, you need mentors outside of the organization. I, it took me a long time to get to that route. So oh man, it's learning. It's it. so, I think it's so real um, because I was literally telling my team this, my last, uh, you know, team meeting that uh, I don't know why it's later in your career that you feel more comfortable with needing to reach out to somebody outside of your organization to learn something. But once you do it, you kind of are kicking yourself about why I didn't do that you know, sooner, right? Because, you know, certainly as you kind of grow, you, you know, you know uh, it's not like I have a leader that's coaching me on exactly what needs to get done. Like maybe, you know, some people that in their early on in the career, they kind of have something naturally. Uh, so I think, you know, I think that's why some people maybe do it later in their in their career. But once you actually do it, one, you realize that a lot of times people are so willing to give. Right. They are so willing to help and 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 share that information, especially in RevOps, because it's this kind of growing. It's always been there, but this kind of growing industry that everybody knows they need help because everybody's figuring out and kind of you know wearing a lot of different hats. Um but also, I think in today's day and age where, you know, some you know, some companies are still remote, um, you know, your 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 leader directly might not be an expert in what you need to ultimately become an expert to be. Uh, and there's so there's such a wealth of information and a wealth of knowledge out there that you almost have to get really good at learning outside of your organization in order to really provide value for yourself. Right. And, and obviously, you know, for your organization. And so. I love that. Uh, I think it's so important. I mean, but I also have read, like, I don't remember the numbers. Someone else would probably know this, but something like, I mean, I know because I've read the book about Tiger Woods. He has something like three or four coaches, right? Like Steph Curry has three or four different coaches. Like you don't get to the top of your game by going, doing it on your own, right? Like you have a swing coach, you have a physio, you have a nutrition coach. I mean, you have everything. Um, and like, why would, and for me as an athlete, that's quite competitive and I want to be at the top of my game and know, you know, be deliver on what I need to deliver as a rev ops leader. Like, why wouldn't I, right. If the best people at the top of their games in every industry or sport that they're in have multiple coaches, why wouldn't I, right. Like, then you think like, that's crazy not to. Yeah. Yeah, preach, preach. I mean, and it's also because I think you have to also recognize that in order for you to get the most out of coaching, sometimes a difference in deliverance is important, right? Like for you to absorb something, having it come from multiple voices in different ways can, you know, have it click better, right? So you almost got to, you know, just be cognizant of that, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I think it's just uh, amazing. And you also mentioned, um, uh, what was it? Um, humble and uh, what was the other one? Hungry and humble. humble and hungry and high EQ. I think everyone should Google it. Love you it. can just get the summary on hiring an ideal team player. There's even a chart of like how to 
fire for it. I use it with all my teens. After I read that, I was like, someone's done all that hard work to figure out how you hire. Why aren't I just going to use this? Yeah. <laughs> Makes so much sense. Uh, I love it. I, I love doing these these things and kind of networking and, and doing that because you kind of get those things that kind of click and it's like, duh, uh, that's amazing. So uh, thank you. Um, I know we, it looks like we got a couple questions from the uh, from the audience. So I definitely want to get into that. So Mallory, I'll, I'll pass this one over to you. Uh, so this one's from James. Uh, so RevOp covers, uh, you know, functions of systems, CRM mainly, sales support, deal desk, reporting, data, enablement, commissions, uh, go to market planning targets, uh, you know, overseeing the flow of data and processes from initial interest through the booking uh, and then customer operations in terms of support uh, and customer success. But, you know, mainly just systems here and some reporting for customer operations. Are there any areas that people tend to cover? You know, I want to make I want to sure I understand so, the question. Yeah. Go ahead. It's like what functions are <laughs> normally in, in RevOps and which ones aren't. So my last company, Insight Partners, was an investor of ours, and they did a survey of all their portfolio companies, their port codes, to say like which functions sat in RevOps that didn't. And it was so interesting, and I'd have to try to dig it up of how many, how different it was depending on the size of the company. But even yeah. like, does, do you own marketing ops or do you not own marketing ops? I think we'll all say like at a certain size, you end up having comp go into finance, right? Like certain size, you almost never own comp, right? If you're going for an IPO, there's all these controls that ends up moving. Um, but anyway, I, I've i seen the chart, but Mallory, I'll, I'll pass it off to you to talk about what your thoughts are. Yeah, no problem. I think it does vary depending on the size of the company. So when you're in that like series B, series C world, it's pretty easy to get unified rev ops where you have sales, marketing, customer success under one umbrella. I do think that customer success is normally the last one to get brought in. Um, I remember when I had joined a certain company, we were getting everything figured out. Salesforce was built really one way for sales and marketing. And then within the exact same Salesforce instance, we had almost duplicated everything for CS. We had different fields for the same information, one used by this group and one used by that one. So we just really had to like tear all of that apart, bring it together, get CS into RevOps so that we could all be unified. And that was awesome. Um, but then again, the bigger you get, the harder it is to move hundreds of people into a unified group. So I have friends at HubSpot, for example, and they're still not a unified revenue operations group because there's like, 500 of them. And so it's just much more complex to bring that many people together into one organization. And so even though they have ways to collaborate with each other, they don't have that common model. Um, so for me in a perfect world, I think that RevOps should be unified and it should report to either the CFO, COO, or CEO. Um, that way you've got kind of that truly unbiased kind of point of view and umbrella. And then depending on how big the company is, you may also have a product led motion. I think that having that connection to product is super important. And then I've even started supporting a few things here and there with um, engineering and working on forecasting and improving gross margins. So lots of different ways for RevOps to get involved all across the company, but you kind of have to be organizationally ready. And I think you have to have the right team in place to make that work. That's terrific. Uh, and James, thank you for asking that question. I apologize if I butchered the translation of uh, of that, but um, you know, hopefully that gives you some context into what you were looking for. Uh, another one from the audience is from Casey. Uh, so curious to hear from your experience how important it is to have admin certification for your CRM of record in the org versus you know being able to hire and work with a, a talented developer. So I guess Mallory, why don't you why don't you take that one? Sure. So I was pretty lucky to get um, certified by Salesforce when I was working at Salesforce. And that was a unique experience because I was at Exact Target and then we acquired Pardot and then Pardot and Exact Target got acquired by Salesforce. And so I was working on the Pardot team and they offered certification for everyone. And I said, well, that's great. I'd love to do it. So got certified and I do think it's really valuable. Um, is it 100% necessary if you've got someone on your team that can do it? Probably not necessary to every situation. 
However, like I mentioned, I think I have such a better ability to brainstorm with my team, come with ideas for solutions, understand how things work on the back end so that I can help scope things correctly and defend my team on how long something's supposed to take. I'm kind of convincing myself as I talk here that it is necessary. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm leaning toward I, like strongly. Recommend. I agree with you, but like, I think we know like the actual certification itself is sort of nonsense, right? The test you yeah. take teaches you nothing about the best practices of how to run a Salesforce org. So the certification looks good to get yourself hired on LinkedIn. But I think what Mallory is saying that I 100% agree with, which is you do need to know Salesforce because almost every RevOps function in the planet is going to use that as their system of record. Like you need to understand it to a certain level of, I don't write Apex triggers. I mess up the flows. My admins want me to stop making flows because <laughs> I'm old school. Like I know how to do workflows. Now we got bloody flows, you know. But um, I think I agree with Mallory though. You do need to have a certain level of uh, like knowledge of how the system works and how the data structure is. For me, I'm really pedantic about the data structure and having a clean data structure that then maps to the rest of our external systems, right? Like a clean, sensible, documented data structure. And that's where I personally think if you don't get that in right the first time, you're nearly, it's nearly impossible. So how do you tag if it's a customer or not? How do you know if it's a former customer? Like that sort of defining the logic and the data structure. Once you have that, then, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be a Salesforce admin. You just need to know like, how does the data work? Uh, you can hire someone, you know, you know, make this field update when close lost. I mean, you can have someone else build the flows. <laughs> Yeah. Lock me out as the case for me, but I don't think the certification necessarily. You just need to know. I agree. You need to know the system, though. And I, and I would even I would even add it's probably with all the systems that you're using within your ecosystem, right? And how they work together, and just being knowledgeable on uh, how to get the best use out of them. One gives you value for yourself um, and allows you to grow internally. Allows you to you know understand different opportunities that may be out there. But also, say you do hire. A developer, you're also able to uh, get more out of that relationship if you have the foundational knowledge yourself. And so I think the answer to the question, I think unanimously is kind of like, yes, to both, you know what I mean? Maybe not necessarily certification, like a, you know, a, a check on a box that maybe gets you hired. The root of it is understanding foundationally how your systems work so you can get the most out of them. And, and uh, I think that in itself is always something that is probably worth diving into um, and going all in on. Um, and so we have another question uh, from Samantha, uh, and this is a great one. It's very, very pointed. Um, and I think, you know, you know, Brooke, we were just talking about how, you know, seeking advice about problems outside of your current organization. This seems like uh, Samantha understood that one, uh, this, this task here. So um, how do you best tie sales development teams uh, buy-in for SDR teams isn't an easy task. As a sales leader, I know that the answer to this is, uh, yeah, it's not an easy task. Um, and I'm sure you both of you guys have had to deal with this in your past. So, uh, you know, Mallory, why don't you uh, take the lead on this one? Yeah, I think it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, if you're trying to establish an SDR team for the first time, I do think it's really kind of a math problem. Like how much time do you want to pay sales reps to do things that aren't closing deals. And if that answer is not very high, you, someone's got to do that work. So sales development is a great way to get that done. Um, if you're asking about the best way to get RevOps involved with sales development, I think that's a different story. And what I've seen work well in the past is just digging into the data, get the reports, look in the system, understand their open rates, reply rates, how many activities they're doing, um, if you understand those things and you bring it to the group and you say, Hey, X, Y, Z is broken. They're like, hold on, wait, what? You know, and then you start to dig in and then they will ask for your support. So I think having insights and reporting are one of the most important ways to kind of get in with that group, because at the end of the day, there is a small aspect of it. That's kind of like numbers game ish. And those small improvements, like Brooke was saying, you can get a lot better very quickly if you just improve your reply rate by 1%, your connect rate by 1%, um, a lot of those things can add up quickly.
Terrific. Uh, Brooke, would you have any, any anything to add there? Um, no, I think Valerie's probably much better on the like activity sort of details on that. The area that early on in my career, my first Salesforce admin job, it was like war between, so the SDR team sat in the marketing org and there, which I don't particularly, I get because marketing has sort of this number depending on, again, I don't even really agree with marketing have a single revenue number because it just is too linear and it's too simplified. We won't go down that path, but so at the time, eight or 10 years ago, the SDRs were in the marketing org and there is this war between marketing and sales about were they sourcing real ops and these ops would move to stage two and were they actually qualified and all this stuff so i have like still have scars from this experience and the biggest takeaway that i've always carried forward into other jobs with sdrs is you have to have agreed upon what qualified looks like right both sides of the house i know this sounds really basic but like agreed in writing what is qualified and agreed on what the handoff is. So like, how are we measuring? Is it for us, it's a stage one op is created as discovery call is completed. And then the rep either moves it forward to stage two and the SDR gets paid when it's stage two and their quota is on stage two or some other metric. But that bit was the part that I've always taken with me, which is like agreed upon what's qualified and agreed upon the handoff. Uh, because that is where lots of stuff can fall apart, especially on the handoff. Like who did what was, you know, where was the notes? What's qualified? Very boring. Amazing. Once you get that into place, I think you can get it kind of operationalized very quickly. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Both. I think both uh, of you guys provide some awesome context. And I think how, how I certainly think about this is uh, one, having clear definitions as Brooke mentioned, but also having uh, the data to support uh, anything that you're going to try to empower and get, you know, SDRs behind is super important, as well as empathy, I think is the other dynamic here that I think uh, I think both both of you guys would agree with. Um, if you haven't sat in an SDR shoes, then you need to understand that they're already thinking that, well, do you really know, right? I think that's just the reality of, 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 of the beast, right? And the, the, I think when you understand the clear expectations, the clear rules and the data, you do, right? But you need to get them behind the fact that you actually do understand. And empathy is something that I think you really got to go all in on. Vulnerability to a certain extent. If you don't know, right, don't pretend like you do. Um, and ultimately that then builds that level of trust that can really actually get you where you're looking to go. So some softer skills there uh, as well, for sure. Um and then uh, another question from Jamie. Um, so what is uh, the most important metric to assess the health of a business? Uh, so Brooke, uh, we'll start with you. Yeah, on, this now. one That's is like one. right up my wheelhouse. So um, in SaaS, we always use net revenue retention. So how much of every dollar that you sign in is then retained the following year and then the following year? And if you want to get really deep and nerdy into this, there's a company called Winning by Design that has built out this revenue architecture class that you could take, but they have a lot of free assets online and they have about six modules. And one of them is about the data model and how you measure essentially net revenue calculation and the whole end to end of the funnel. In the payments world, we talk a lot about time to revenue because we have this aspect of We've engaged with the merchant. They want to do business with us. How long does it take us to get them approved through compliance, onboarded, get them integrated because we have to integrate to their website or their Shopify or whatever, and get them generating transactions, which is live transactions on their website. A little bit different because in software, you just get a DocuSign contract signed and you've gotten the revenue. For ours, it's a bit more of, we have a lot of hurdles to get through the journey. And so net revenue, or um, Time to revenue is a big one for us, which is like, can we shorten it? Because, the, you know, it takes a merchant maybe six months to ramp. So we're month two in the year. We basically know we have to have all our merchants start doing live transactions by June for us to get them fully ramped by the end of the year. So the shorter we can make this time to revenue to get them ramped faster and generating revenue faster, the better we're likely going to do at the end of 
the year. It is the exact opposite of software where you're like, let's sign all the contracts at the end of the year and possible <laughs> discounts. We are very front loaded, which is if we don't get them live in the next four months, we won't get really any material revenue. Um, but Mallory, I don't know if you have anything you want to talk about on the, the how you measure health within your business. Yeah, I have a couple of fun ones. Um, I do enjoy revenue per employee. I think that's a really telling way to think through how efficient you are as an organization. Uh, hopefully you're not getting there by just lessening the number of employees. That's you know a different story, but being able to understand like at time of acquisition, oh, this company was at a million revenue per employee. Like that's so cool to me. Um, the one that I live and breathe though is the logo retention rate. And so this is something that would just basically look at any given quarter, how many people or companies are up for renewal. How many of them say yes? And how many of them say no? And it's not based on their dollars. It's based on the number of them. Um, the reason I like to look at this is because even though NRR is amazing, it can cover a lot of sins. Like you can hide so many ugly things with one really big upsell and it makes your net revenue retention look awesome, but really you lost half your customers last quarter. So we have to be really careful, I think, to just kind of balance those things. And I like to say, um, well, I've said it like one time. So I think that when a customer chooses to renew, it's just as important as getting a new deal, right? And every time they renew, they're choosing you again. And so you really just want to have as many people as possible saying yes. And I think the rest of the business kind of sorts itself out. If customers are happy and they're staying, um, everything else is, is a lot easier to get accomplished. Oh, that's great. The, so many good nuggets there. Uh, I think there's a lot of different ways to look at it. A lot of things are important. Um, and I think you, you guys did a really good job of articulating that. So uh, I know we're kind of coming up on time here and I love the questions. This is amazing, guys. Thank you so much for asking. Uh, the next one is Jack uh, coming from Jack. So how do you find the most impactful projects to work on uh, low hanging when when low hanging fruit has been taken care of? Um so I guess, Mallory, why don't you why don't you lead us on this one? Yeah, I think the low hanging fruit and picking which fire is like the hottest to put out first is really important. And then you do have to ask yourself, like, how do you prioritize after that? Um, I like to try to do whatever is closest to the customer or like the revenue. So in a world where you've got problems throughout the entire pipeline, I would rather go solve the one that's in stage six not stage one, because anything I fix at stage one, if it's still traveling down this road to be derailed at stage six, then it's not as effective. So I try to get as close as I can to like the end of the road and fix backwards, because then you know that all of the things you're sending through have a best chance of getting close. One. Yeah, I agree. Closest to revenue. Still hard Based to money. figure out sometimes, but yeah, closest to revenue. I, I mean, I do. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that's been deprioritized in my work. <laughs> like, if we can't get the merchant approved by onboarding and compliance, all of the rest of it's moot. So, exactly. does it matter if we have fancy support tools? We got to get them approved first. So, in our world, that's the number one hurdle to get automated. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think chase the money is is a big one, but also like what things do you say no to as well, right? Uh, you know, uh, maybe not everything is something that you should be prioritizing your time on. Uh, and I think that's sometimes even more of the challenge, uh, certainly for RevOps folks. There's so many things that, that you can fix, so many things that can be improved. Um, so the next question is from uh, to Josh. Hopefully I pronounced that right. I really apologize if I didn't. Um, but what is your view on SDR teams and their KPIs? Uh, should they be tagged to revenue close for leads opportunities generated by them uh, for sales teams? Um, or should it be something else? So I say no. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, say no. Ahead. Because I think the general rule on KPIs is it should be something that you have control over, right? So if you're going to hold someone accountable for it, then they should be empowered. I, you know, I, I had a boss to say, if you're going to be held accountable for it, then you should be empowered to deliver what you're being held accountable for. SDRs have no, absolutely no influence on if a deal closes or if it's going to be for a certain size. So I wouldn't put it as a KPI. I might put it as a little spiff. You get a couple percentage 
of whatever the first year revenue is, but I would not put it as a KPI. I mean, that's just rule number one of KPIs. It has to be something the person can control. And if at the end of the day it's absolutely outside of their control, you shouldn't be measuring them on it. And they can control the number of qualified ops they source to sales reps. So I've always had that be what we measure them on, but they can't control any of the other things. So that's yeah. my thoughts. I don't know if Mallory has any other comments. Yeah. I totally agree. It's got to be something that they can mostly control. So giving them a couple percent off the top when the deal closes, I think is amazing. Keeps people interested, right? Um, the other thing that I remember you mentioning, Brooke, was paying at stage two. I've seen a very similar process. It was like going from stage zero to stage one, same idea. You want them to be really motivated to get the first meeting. And then if that somehow gets moved or canceled or there's a no-show, you want them to be incentivized to rebook it. And then you also want that quality incentive in place. And so paying them on the second step is the best way to try to make sure that the quality is in there. And you really just have to be careful to keep it all in balance. Um, so I kind of like to balance that very first meeting getting booked and the quality metric, trying to not make it too confusing. But I think a couple different pieces together is the best way. A hundred percent. I think when it comes to, to compensation, it's like, what can you control? And what is the ultimate goal we are looking to achieve from this mm -hmm. specific task? Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, the task is to schedule a meeting and have that meeting be quality. Then the compensation should probably be be tied to that. Like you don't have to overthink it. There obviously could be the unique metrics to help, you know, uh, uh, emphasize the right behaviors associated with that. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, this is what we do. We help organizations, you know, with compensation all the time. And that's typically what you always end up coming back to. Um but uh, I think we got time for one question. So I apologize for everybody who, who we weren't able to get to. But uh, this next one comes from Kevin. Uh, how do you feel about LTV as a key measure? Um, so Mallory, why don't, why don't you lead us on this one? Yeah, so LTV or lifetime value, I think is definitely, um, it's got its place. Like it's very nice to keep an eye on. A couple of things that can help you improve this are, better renewal rates, keeping the customer longer. Also better net retention means that the customers are growing. So you're going to get more LTV if the customer grows over their uh, tenure with you. So I think there are a few things that can influence that metric that are important. Um, but at the end of the day, I think right now it's more about the efficiency of how do you get those customers? So if the LTV is, you know, hundred dollars for easy math, but you're spending a thousand dollars to get the customer. It's really that ratio that's more important to understand because the chances of you making your money back on that customer are really very slim. So I think it's all about, you know, their value, but also what it takes to get them in the door. Yeah, I agree with Mallory. I don't have anything to add. So maybe we think we're getting the <laughs> wrap up sign. <laughs> <laughs> we need to wrap up the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, where's the, where's the music coming? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ricardo, uh, go ahead and, and uh, cut us off. Um, I, I, yeah, Eduardo, you're here to close it out for us. Amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Speakers Mike. Uh, oh, that was fantastic. Audience, you are the best for MSB. For the questions we couldn't answer, I am dropping the speakers link in the chat right now. So let's just go. Uh, Line. Uh, please connect to the speakers. And then if you liked, uh, I heard a lot of people saying that RevOps need to plan the compensation plans and that a little that's a little bit difficult. Uh, our stage is here to help. So there is a button at the top of this page for you to request a demo with our sponsors. Um, and then the team will get in touch with you later today. Um, audience, uh, we need to wrap things up. Uh, thank you everyone for attending here today. Uh, we love having you here. Uh, thank you for our wonderful speakers um, and for our wonderful sponsors. Please connect with the speakers on LinkedIn and uh, learn a little bit more about our sponsors. And I will see you in our next uh, Modern Sales Pros event. Speakers, we can go hang out backstage. Uh, thank you all so, so much for coming. Bye bye, audience. Thanks.